What's up, everybody? Eric here. I am back again with David Hunter. Like I was just saying, this is actually the fifth time I'm connecting with him. We've set up this really cool quarterly cadence. And I was like actually explaining to him just like I did on the last video. It's really cool to kind of get a download of what you're seeing right now, get an idea of how different up and comings have impacted what you're seeing and your projections. So there's a lot to talk about, obviously, as per usual. I mean, I started a YouTube channel like the perfect time because there's no shortage of drama almost every single time I connect with you. So before that, though, as always, welcome back. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, I'm looking forward. There's a handful of things that I'm really excited to talk about. I want to talk a little, little bit about 2022. Then I obviously want to talk about 2023 and looking forward from there. But to kick us off, keeping it in a general logical order, looking back at 2022, what were some of the major economic themes that stood out to you? Yeah, for sure. The Fed was the dominant story. Um, and before that, Ukraine, I think. We came into 2022, I had expected a correction and and then a, a quick return to new highs, you know, maybe spend a quarter in correction and then go. But then Ukraine hit and uh, it changed the whole landscape. It, you know, drove oil through the roof and it caused inflation to spike. Um, and, and from there it was, as we say, uh, the Fed took over. So, um, yeah, those were pr probably the dominant things um and we're still dealing with both obviously coming into this year the difference is the fed you know the fed hiked aggressively faster than we've ever seen them hike uh you know the rate increases that we saw both from the fed and in the bond market were the fastest on record and it was it's it's not so much the level of rates but the speed of that hike or the speed of that rise in rates that really has hit the economy and is, I think, going to hit it very hard uh, as we move through this year. So um, it's easy to get caught in, you know, historic numbers and say, oh, the interest rates are, you know, four and a half percent big deal. Um, you know, when we've been at double digits, we've been, you know, we've been at seven or eight percent. We've been a lot higher than this in even not that many years ago. Um, but it's that rapid rise from almost 0% rates to where we're heading for 5%. And I just don't think the Fed grasps how dramatic an impact that's going to have on the economy. And I don't think they really understand um, that it's it, it's going to get there. It just doesn't get there all at once. So if you're looking at that and saying, well, we're not seeing the damage, we don't think it's so bad. I think they're going to be very surprised that all of a sudden they're going to see the damage and it's too late. It's interesting that you talk about seeing the damage. The recent PPI figures came out and they were significantly lower than what most people were projecting, something to the tune of like 1.2% below the recent forecast. Do you think that that's part of that coming to fruition where we've had this really aggressive cycle and now we're starting to get to the back end where it's almost like the inverse where some of these metrics are just contracting so fast? And I'm, do, Is that what's happening here or are you seeing something different? No, it is what's happening. I mean, we we are, uh, you know, even since last summer, I've been talking about inflation coming down a lot faster than and coming down a lot sharper than the Fed understands or than a lot of people understand. You know, we were seeing, I mean, look, look what gasoline prices have done. Look what oil prices have done. It took a while to get there. You know, I was beat up because I was calling for, you know, oil to fall back into the 80s and then lower than that. And you know, oil was still up in the hundreds, and they're going, "You're, you're looking the wrong direction." And finally, when it happened, it happened pretty quickly, but it took a while. And I think you'll see the same thing in jobs and and a lot of other parts of the economy. Is yeah, it takes a while for for it all, you know, for Fed policy to work through the system and have its impact. Um, when you know financials, when you look at um, you know, we're just starting to see the credit deterioration in the banks. Mm -hmm. that, that's going to hit hard, I think, by the second half of this year. Um, and, you know, again, the Fed's kind of looking at it month to month and saying we're seeing deterioration, but it's not anything alarming and we're not worried about it yet. The problem is, but, you know, policy works with such a long lag that by, by managing policy that way, 
you're guaranteeing you're going to be way late. So, yeah, I mean, PPI did not surprise me, uh, nor did CPI. I mean, I think we're we're at that point where you're finally going to have year over year numbers, you know, because the numbers a year ago were were high. As those high numbers drop off, it's getting lower. Um, plus, if you look at, you know, I follow obviously commodity futures a lot. You know, look at what you're seeing, as I said, gasoline, but look what you see in lumber prices. You know, it was 1700 a year and a half ago. And, you know, now it's, you know, down to 350 or whatever, 400. So, um, you know, those are huge drops. And we're seeing it. We saw it in copper. We saw it in steel prices were coming down hard. So there's a lot of, and a lot of the metal prices were coming down hard. So there's a lot of things that you could tell that we were just, you know, you had to get to that point where it really impacted the indexes. And I think it's just starting. So so the news going forward and people keep wondering how you can be bullish with all the negative news, particularly the economy getting weaker, as I expect. Um, the thing is that you can probably assume going forward, not, not every month, maybe, but going forward, you're going to have easier inflation numbers. So that means the Fed's somewhere in here going to wake up and say, I guess we did do our job, or I guess it has impacted. Uh, but the problem is, at the same time that's happening, the economy's getting impacted. And by the time they finally figure out uh, that inflation's been beaten, they've already done tremendous damage to the economy. Leads me to a follow-on question. This is more of a personal one. I've noticed it with a handful of economic releases over the past two weeks or so where the forecasts are whatever they are, and then the actuals have a pretty significant variance. This is everything from existing home sales, PPI, CPI, um, unemployment. Like there's been a bunch of them so far. I want to understand beyond the superficial, you know, yeah, okay, the, the Fed or, you know, the different entities that are tracking these metrics, they're just guessing and they're way off. Like, why are we so far off on these estimates versus actuals? I'm... I assume there's got to be more to it than just they're throwing some numbers in and it's just way off. I, I just don't understand it. Yeah, and it's not that at all. I mean, in fact, I'm, uh, you know, I don't try to forecast month to month. Um, but, you know, the economists that do, they've, they're pretty good. They have a pretty good handle on putting, putting the indexes together and breaking apart and figuring out the various components. The problem is, um, you're getting to a point where you're, you know, I call it an inflection point, but you're at a point where things are starting to break down. So if you're kind of extrapolating or basing it on, you know, the gradual change that you're expecting, all of a sudden you're, you know, things, things happen slowly until they don't. <laughs> and then all of a sudden um, things break in the other direction. So I, I, I think it's just that we're coming to that inflection point. Um, not to mention uh, also the jobs. I mean, you saw um, all of a sudden they had a, uh, um, they worked on the jobs and the, the, the year over year number was way off. I mean, they had, you know, what they had reported right. over the past year was off by a lot. And it, some of it's seasonal adjustment factors, you know, that, that stuff is, I just don't pay attention to monthly numbers like that, particularly not jobs, because you do see these, you know, all of a sudden, once a year, whenever they they find this big error and they adjust it. So, you know, the Fed's actually managing policy by monthly numbers, basically, you know, looking at data monthly when that data we know all of a sudden either can all of a sudden change or you're going to find that data you were relying on needed to be, you know, re was recalculated and found out it was way off. So uh, from reality, so I just I'm not a big fan of uh, managing monetary policy on a month to month data basis. But that's, you know, when they say they're data dependent, that's what they mean. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm much more focused as a strategist on trends sure. and knowing knowing full well that I'm timing wise, it's going to take time and and I'm not going to be able to precisely know. But, you know, that's. To me, trends are far more important than month-to-month -month data. Which leads me, that helps a lot. That was actually my guess, was that essentially there was some sort of typical scaling factor they were using, and then there's an acceleration essentially that occurs at some point that they kind of get caught with. 
So it's it seems kind of in line with my general um, my general guess. Another personal question that I have for you. I've talked to a handful of friends and whatnot. There's economists from all different walks of life, essentially. There's an interesting theme I noticed. Most of them don't actively trade. Some of them invest, but most of them seem to not actively trade. This could just be my small sample, but is there, why is that? Like, why am I even seeing that small sample trend? Uh, you're talking about economists? Generally, yeah. or yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you know. Again, economists are are um, understand that month to month is is highly unpredictable. You know, they try to predict it, but they're they also know themselves that you know they're not going to hit it right all the time. And I think so. They're they carry that over to the market where they think the shorter the horizon. The less predictability. That's my view. Uh, unfortunately, retail investors come in and lots of professional traders as well, thinking the most predictable is the shorter time frame. I'm quite the opposite. You know, the, give me a longer time frame, and I can tell you what I think is going to happen. I think it's because economists and and you know strategists are looking at bigger picture. You know, it's it's again you know that old saying about you can't see the forest for the trees. You know, the retail trader, the retail investor is focused on the trees. The economist and the strategist is focused on the, you know, the forest. Makes total sense. And again, my hypothesis where uh, there was that you have to have a certain part of you that's at least partially unhinged to actively trade because of exactly that. Like when we look at just markets in general, I can quantitatively display to you positive drift over 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I can't show you that on short time frames, other than sometimes post earnings. But that's exactly what I was expecting. It's just that it's almost like they know better and they kind of weight their their um, effort more efficiently than that. But yeah, I was just curious, obviously, because you're you're in that same group and you know far more of them than I do. But yeah, just... to be to be to be fair to good traders, and because there are good traders out there, sure. you know, they can that you know their their methods are focused on short term and they can pick yep. up things that have some predictability and you know you're playing probabilities with all of this anyway so it's not to say that some people can't be successful at trading they're certainly very successful traders it's it's that the majority of retail investors have come in with almost a gambling mentality that 100%. you know they think they can kind of try to predict what's going to happen in the next week or month or a few days or whatever. And the odds are they're not even understanding the relationships, you know, the, the, the leads and lags, the, the discounting nature of markets, and the fact that what they're focused on, they may be judging it based on news. And that news may have been discounted a while ago. So there, uh, that's why I think oftentimes investors are confused when they say, well, we got exactly what we we're looking for and the market went down. How come? You know, well, it's because it's, you know, it's less times it's buy the rumor, sell the fact, you know, it's so there's a lot of that, too, that goes into investing is understanding that markets are discounting something in the future. You know, markets can be discounting six to nine months out. That doesn't mean right. they are uh, adjusting along the way. But, um, you know, thinking that today's news is today's market, I think, is a big mistake. It's a really, really good point. It's actually something I talk out against a lot because I see people do that with earnings a lot. So obviously I'm a derivatives trader. I trade a lot of options and people will say, oh, they, they missed earnings. Why did it rally? Yep. And it's, you know, that exact force you're talking about. Another question I wanted to dive into with you, because from a militaristic standpoint, I have a general concept of, you know, essentially Russia invading Ukraine and the implications and I also had a, a fair idea of, of the economic implications at the time of with natural gas, wheat, things like that. Now that this is like still going on, it's a pretty prolonged engagement. Are there any like longer term implications of this that me focusing on the trees, I'm missing from the forest? Ask that again. I'm not sure. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm primarily curious about Russia invading Ukraine. When it first happened, I was able to come up with a couple themes. I understand the natural gas aspect of things, the food aspect, those kinds of stuff, especially coming into the winter. But I'm wondering, since this has been a pretty prolonged engagement, the market, in my opinion, probably has synthesized a lot of the implications of this. 
but I'm really curious about the longer term implications of Russia invading Ukraine from an economic standpoint. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of it was just kind of early on. Obviously, oil very quickly ran there and then, you know, it's been heading south since, mm-hmm. um, you know, weed and corn. If you look, the, the biggest the bulk of the um, the spike happened very quickly. Uh, and I, so I think what happens is you have an emotional response to it initially, some of it based on reality, but it's it's emotional. And then you settle down and you realize that these markets are, are global markets. The oil is fungible. It can find its way, even though, um, you know, the oil may not go from Russia or the natural gas from Russia to Germany anymore it's still out there and it, it may go to somewhere. You know, so let's say it goes to India or China. Mm-hmm. They, that means they may um, not need some of the oil they were buying from other sources. So that goes somewhere else. So, you know, these are global markets and that the, the other you know, resources, it's a global demand story as well. So some of it is that that softens some of the, you know, what would otherwise be operations or, or, um, you know, uh, alterations to what the normal landscape is. Um, and some of it is, I think, we just don't know. I mean, you can discount things uh, based on probabilities to some extent, but as this drags on, you know, I get people constantly saying, well, how, how does, you know, what if Ukraine does this or, or what if Russia does this or right. this happens? What does that do to your forecast? And I generally don't answer because it's like, right. I can't you know? forecast that. You know, I'm, right. I'm not going to play hypotheticals that I can't forecast. I can get, you know, the minute I say that, then you're going to say, well, okay, so you're, you know, you're changing your forecast. No, I, you know, you know, war is tough to know what, you know, you can't predict what, particularly with, with Putin, you can't predict what, how long he's going to go on or, or those kind of things. What I can do is look at the markets and see the impact that's had so far and say, unless something dramatic changes, yeah, I think that's already discounted. That makes a ton of sense. And on that same thread, is that why we're seeing natural? I'm, I personally am surprised that natural gas has contracted as much as it has in price. It's gone from like 10 and change um, towards the end of last year. Now it's down at like three. Is, yeah. is it because of those alternate sources essentially are finding their way into the global market? It's some of that. Obviously, um, you know, the storage was done ahead of time. So all the doom and gloom is really, you know, we, we knew they, they had filled their storage tanks that, you know, Germany and, and Europe were pretty well prepared for this one or what, what happens going forward is a, a bigger question mark. But it's, it is some of that that, you know, the markets are fungible. It's also, I think, um, at least it feeds into my view that, you know, there's a lot more damage being done by these central banks underneath the surface and that it's gonna, it's impacting demand. You know, two, two things impact demand. One, when prices run up, people, people uh, start using less of something. Um, you know, so when gasoline prices went to five dollars, um, you know, driving became somewhat, you know, people were more careful with their driving. They weren't planning as long trips, et cetera. Um, and and the other thing that impacts it is the economy. And if the Fed's overstaying its welcome on the tight side, the economy is getting weaker. And, and I think is that's, you know, you know, I'm calling for a global bust later this year. It's not that we're going to be fine until we get there. We're going to be in recession and then recession goes into global bust. I think that's true of the world. You know, the world's demand for these items is being impacted by central banks who were focused on yesterday's problem. Yesterday's problem was inflation. I think tomorrow's problem is deflation and they haven't recognized it yet. Got it. And that actually touches kind of neatly on the next topic. The last few times we were talking, the general sentiment you were sharing was kind of this parabolic rise into a, you know, 80% plus global bust. And over 
the different times we've spoken, there's been different catalysts that have intervened and essentially just your analysis of that. So it sounds like that's still generally your forecast here. Is that right? And if so, can you just walk me through what you're seeing? Sure. Yeah, my view has not changed at all. I think we um, saw the end of the bear market on October 13th when uh, you know the CPI came out. The market uh, went down below 3,500 in the first hour and reverse quickly. And we haven't looked back since we, you know, we haven't seen 3,500 since then. Um, we've, we ran up to 4,000. We're right around that 200 day moving average and it backed off um, to, you know, before, before um, let's say in December, we, we backed off to 3,800. And mm -hmm. then in January, we've run back up to that 4,000 area and backed off to 3,900. I suspect we are ready to break through the 208 moving average probably next week. I mean, we've broke, you know, we broke through a little bit before we backed off, but I think decisively break through it next week and probably see 4,300 pretty quickly. And not that long after that, 4,600. That's kind of where I am in terms of the more you know, near term, intermediate term, I, I don't pretend to put as much faith in my short term stuff, but sure. I do think we're probably ready to ramp up here. And that's kind of ironic in that um, everybody's thinking we're on the verge of a meltdown, you know, that we're, we're going to see 3000 very quickly, not, not see a, a move up. So I think if we, if we do see what I'm, I'm expecting here, it's going to cause a lot of, because um, there's there's a large majority of um, both market analysts and investors that are expecting down, not up, and thinking that we're you know we're this bear market rally is almost over, and I'm saying no, this is the beginning of the bull, next bull leg, um, and that we will push through here. And once we push through that 200 day with any um, oomph, any decisiveness, it will cause at least some of those bears to begin rethinking and saying, mm, I'm, I'm not so sure this is a bear market rally anymore. Many will stay to a bear market rally, but have higher targets, you know, say, okay, well, it's going a little higher, but you know, it's not, it's not off to the races. But ultimately I think that's what we're gonna see is you're gonna have shorts having to cover, you're gonna have people allocated to bonds having to reallocate to equities. And I think that's what, you know, the first quarter and probably the first half of this year is going to be about is you know we spent much of 2022 with people reallocating away from equities uh becoming you know as they became more and more bearish and in a fairly concentrated few months i think a lot of that allocation that reallocation that happened over say nine months um could could be reversed in say three months and that's why i can talk about such a big move as i think we're going to have a very illiquid rally um, or or bull leg, if you will, uh, because I think it happens in a more concentrated period of time. You know, the down happened over nine months. The up happens over, let's say, three, four, five months. So it sounds like there's a couple of primary catalysts that would drive this move for you. It seems like some of it is the inflation data continuing to show some cooling, which might put some wind in the market sales. It sounds like you were talking about um, shifting of broader institutional capital from risk off into more risk on, trying to catch the move. And is or are those the main catalysts that you're seeing that would drive kind of the move from like 4,000 to say 46? Well, those are the mechanical catalysts, I guess. You know, the it's, um, you know, position, repositioning um, and flow of funds is obviously going to be important to any, any market rally. Um, but the catalyst might be a weak dollar, you know, the dollar breaking down mm. further. Uh, the catalyst will be, you know, the 10 year going from, you know, 340 to say 250 in the next few months uh, as, as the weakness in the economy becomes better known. And probably the biggest catalyst is going to be, it's, it's why I've kind of um, not been worried about what everybody else is worried about is work no matter what you think in terms of how many more hikes there are or whatever, the bulk of the Fed's tightening is behind us, not ahead of us. 
Yeah. And, and you know, we can we can argue over how many more hikes there are going to be, whether it's two more quarter point hikes or whatever. They can't ignore this weakness in the economy for much longer. You know, what we saw in industrial production this, this week, what we've seen in the ISM reports, what we've seen in the consumer, you know, it just they cannot just continue to say, oh, our whole focus is on um, jobs. Uh, we don't believe inflation is beaten yet. And we think the stock market has to go to 3000 before we can ease. I mean, those are ridiculous statements or ridiculous ways to approach policy. And I don't think they're going to be able to ignore the weakness for that much longer. So whether we get a quarter point hike in February and another quarter point in March, whether we get a half point and a quarter point, uh, I don't really care. I've, I've said for several months now, the bond market's going to lead the Fed and the bond market's already telling you that the Fed's gone too far and that it's time to ease. I was so, going to ask exactly that because I, I follow the mob markets pretty closely and it looks like already the latter half of this year, they're looking to price in essentially lower rates. So what, what what's the defunct there? Why are those two so decoupled? Well, this is always true. I mean, the, the that's why I don't like the, the Fed um, targeting the stock market and that's what essentially what they're doing is saying we're gonna we have we have uh, an opinion on where the stock market should be and we aren't going to stop tightening until we get it there so every time the market lifts its head i'll get to your question in a second but every time sure. the market lifts its head out comes some of the FOMC members or some of the you know powell's minions calling for you know more hawk, you know, they they talk very hawkishly and call for more hikes and saying we're not anywhere near done. It's so transparent. They're trying to scare the market. The way they talk, they're they don't you know I call them Captain Obvious. I mean it's very, very clear what they're trying to do. They're trying to jawbone the market down because they've bought into Bill Dudley's thesis that you know, we aren't going to beat inflation unless we really tighten financial conditions and tightening financial c conditions can't happen without the market being much lower. So that's their that's their um, focus. Unfortunately, I think that's their biggest focus. And then along with that, it's, oh, well, we aren't going to stop tightening until we see the jobs really break. That's a heck of a you know poor way to manage policy, in my opinion. But that's what they're doing. Um, and, and markets lead. The reason I hate so much that they are focused on the market is the market is a lot, as a, as a predictor, they don't know, and the market doesn't always get it right. But in the aggregate, the market is a much better predictor of the future than is any economist, than is the Fed, and, and uh, the bond market as well, so stock and bond markets. And I've said, Really, since early in 2022, in January 2022, I was making statements about um, the bond market will lead and the Fed will follow, and uh, that's exactly what we're seeing. So, so the 10-year got up to 430 and change, 435 or whatever it was, and is now, you know, down at 340 and was down at 335, so 100 base points lower, and the Fed's still talking about higher higher rates. Well. I'll trust the bond market much more than I trust the stock market, or much more than I trust the Fed, because in the aggregate, the bond market has a a, a history of seeing the future. And as I've said, it discounts the right. future. So you know, I don't. The Fed has a lousy tracker, not just this FOMC, this current makeup, but FOMCs and and Feds forever have had a lousy record when it comes to predicting the economy and when to stop tightening and when, you know, when to stop easing. Uh, Fed's not very good at that because again, they're backward looking. They're focused on data that is by definition looking backwards, uh, telling you what's already happened, not what's going to happen. Markets are forward looking and not, not any one person, not any, you know, 10 pundits, but in the aggregate, the market will have large numbers it's a discounting mechanism and it is discounting, has a good track record of seeing the future better than, than any forecaster. So, um, so right now you are, if you were looking at the bond market, you would say the bond market's telling you inflation's been conquered. 
uh, or at least to a large extent, and that um, you know the economy is weakening, and that's exactly what I think. So, um, and meanwhile, the Fed is saying inflation has not been conquered, and we think we're we're engineering a soft landing. I mean, who who do you trust? I trust the bond market. Um, and, you know, stock market's a little different story, but the bond market basically is telling you that. Yeah, and, and I think that that's really my, my point of confusion is exactly that, is obviously the Fed can see that themselves. Is it, are they just trying, it seems to me that in a lot of ways the Fed is trying to maintain their cadence. They've been super steady ever since they decided that this was the path they were going to take. It's been almost every single Fed meeting the same story. Is it literally just that, that they just don't want to change what they're messaging until it's exactly time to change? Because to me, that's the part I don't understand, is the bond market is already showing us this. I know the Fed can see it, but they're still messaging something that's so far away from that. That's like the decoupling that I just, I can't understand. Yeah, it's, a, it's a number of things. First of all, they got burnt. You know, Powell got burnt by being late to the game. He, he, you know, he thought inflation was transitory, and he argued that uh, into this year, and then got caught, you know, flat-footed when it took off. So, and you know, there are lots of people criticizing him for that. Um, and and it, you know, there was a lot of supply-side issues that were contributing to it. And then Ukraine was wasn't necessarily predictable. So. You know, you got to give him a pass on some of that. Sure. But I think he took that criticism to heart. And again, it's human nature. And now he's doing the exact opposite. He's he's saying, well, I don't want to get caught in that place again. Well, he doesn't realize the place he's going is going to be even more criticism and, and I think more dire in terms of its its impact. Um, right. But so it's partly that. Uh, it's partly history does show that inflation um, if you if you uh, back off from fighting it too soon, you can get caught saying I shouldn't have done that because you know it, it, yes it came down but then it reversed quickly and now I'm I've got an even harder job trying to rein it in again. So you know some of his legitimate worry that if they if they stop short they're going to make their job even tougher and and you know and then don't forget there's a cost to this if if inflation isn't conquered and it does break out to higher highs interest rates are going a lot higher mm. and we have a government with you know massive debt that it could it could afford maybe at 2% but is going to have a hard time affording at five or six or seven or eight percent. I mean, that's part of my story for later on in the decade. But um, you know, they they are there are legitimate reasons for them wanting to fight. My my only contention right now is that I think they've gone too far. Right. Uh, that you know their worries are the wrong worries right now. Like I said, I think um, you look at the inversion in the yield curve. Uh, you look at you know what's happening in some of the commodity prices like lumber and you if you know um leads and lags the way i do you're seeing all the evidence you need to see to say deflation is a risk not inflation and they're just not there yet um, but mm -hmm. i think the next few months it's going to be hard for them not to be there they probably aren't going to be in the deflation camp but they they may get to the point where they say we at least have to pause because it looks like we've done some damage here. We have to pause and see how much damage we've done or how how slow the economy is getting. So, uh, you know, people, again, want to focus on pivot. And I go, I'm, I'm not even my my aggressive stock market forecast is not based on a pivot. They could or they may pivot. Uh, more likely, they pause. Um, and that pause is going to be a big that's going to be received in a big way by the street, sure. you know, if, yeah. if, because that, what does a pause mean to the street? A pause means they finally woken up and, and understand that, you know, they may have gone too far. They aren't ready to say they have gone too far, but they've at least, and in the street's mind, it's going to be tightening's over. Of course. And that's, Absolutely. you know, that's, that's when bottoms and markets happen. So that's when you're going to see that 
uh, instead of a stampede for the exits, it's going to be a, a buying stampede. You know, in, in, in bear markets, you get this, you know, somebody yell fire in a crowded theater and everybody's running through the same exit. And that's why prices drop quickly. In this case, it's going to be the reverse of that, where right. if, if, if everybody, if, if the Fed pauses, you're going to have an awful lot of people who are on the bear side reach the same conclusion at once, which is, gee, Fed tightening may be over. This is the time to buy. Uh, and then you'll see how liquid this market is. I think from a at least a trader's perspective, I could not agree with you more on that. Even the last few Fed meetings, they're already the market's already saying, oh, this might be the pivot. We might be pivoting. So I, I completely agree with you. As soon as they see anything that looks even close to that, it's going to be a, a broad capitulation. Um, we're coming up on I time. I just want but... to throw I just want to yeah. throw in a caveat because this is, you know, just from my life on Twitter, I know this. Um, that does not mean it's straight up to six thousand. Right. You know, you're going to have stair steps along the way. You're going to have pullbacks along the way. But it does mean that all those people say, oh, 4,000 is as high as you're going and you're going back to 3,000 or 3,200 or whatever. It means more likely 4,000 is the beginning of something. Take you, like I said, the 4,300, 4,600, maybe new highs. And where I think the real takeoff point comes, and you may pull back from there, you know, for a little while. Um, but the real takeoff happens, I think, once we make new highs in a decisive way, that's where you get that parabolic melt up. So, uh, you know, those that want to believe that I'm saying from 4,000 to 6,000 is going to happen in 10 minutes, I'm not. I, I don't know how that the shape of that is going to be. It's going to be it's going to be fast. And I think steep and faster than we've seen in history, maybe. But that doesn't mean you can't have pullbacks along the way that last for you know weeks at a time. So sure. um, anyway, yeah, it's I think it's an important note. Uh, a lot of people, especially traders, we're known for our patience. So as soon as something doesn't immediately <laughs> play out how we want, um, then yeah. Um, so we're coming up on time, but your your community always lights me on fire if we don't talk about precious metals. So I refuse to exit the conversation without asking your view on precious metals, which is actually, you know, kind of purposely placed this way, one for jest, but also because I've been trading gold quite a bit lately myself. And I just love your thoughts on that because the last few times you had a really interesting perspective on specifically gold, but yeah, what are your thoughts on precious metals as we sit now? Yeah, I'm I'm very bullish on the metals. I think they, you know, they've led this year. Uh, it may not feel like uh, uh, at times because they, you know, they ran up and then they correct. But um, we're seeing the both gold is is up at levels that we haven't seen for a while, yep. um, and and silver's uh, up, you know, near twenty four. I think we are going to see a very strong next six months in the metals and. Um, you know, I'm continuing to call for 50 to 60 and, and more likely 60 on silver and 3000 on gold. And that 3000 may or may not be aggressive enough, but that's where I'm at. I mean, I, I think that may be good enough, but it's possible given the move that I see coming in silver, gold could move even higher than that. So, um, I think we have a big move in the metals coming. Um, part of it's the dollar, part of it's lower interest rates. Part, you know, a big part of it, I think, will be if you get if you get the feeling the Fed's done tightening, that's the most bullish thing you can tell the metals markets. You know, it's wind at your back instead of in your face. Um, and so I think that's all going to happen. The miners will be sympathetic ralliers with that, with some big moves. Miners typically, you know, in a bull market in the metals, the miners will outperform the metals. So. Um, you know, you should have some pretty good moves in the, in the, you know, gold miners and the silver miners as well. And by the way, it's not just the precious metals. Copper looks great here. Um, it's another reason why it's a little hard to be negative on the market. Uh, because, you know, if we were, if we were heading into, you know, the, the real dumps, copper would not be moving up like it is. So part of that is probably China reopening. Uh, no mm -hmm. question, but uh, I think, you know, I've been calling for $6 copper, and I was saying that last year when it looked impossible, uh, and copper was only going down, but I do think we're probably going to see um, $6 copper, so 
um, you know, that that's another one that should do well. Even the steels look like they're waking up. So there, there's a lot. Of, and, and I'll tell you, look where the Dow is. The Dow's not that far off of new highs. You know, yes, the NASDAQ has a long way to go. The SP has a long way to go. Russell has a long way to go. The Dow doesn't have that far to go to new highs. And it's, you know, to me, um, industrials, commodities, all those things look like they're in play. I think it's really enlightening, especially to see kind of this broad orchestra of bullish movements. And as always, you do have some audacious targets, which are always fun to to keep an eye on and see how things play out. So first off, again, as always, absolute pleasure. Thank you for spending some time, you know, sharing what you've learned over decades with us. Where can people find you? I'm sure. Yeah, they can find me at Twitter. I'm, I'm on there most days getting you know, giving it out as well as getting it. So, <laughs> um, and uh, it's uh, my handles at Dave H Contrarian. I want to just reiterate: there are some people, particularly right now, that are out there using my name with a different handle, making it look like it's me. Sometimes even pretending to sound like me, but with some you know sarcasm in it, or you know trying to start fights, making it look like I'm trying to do that. So. That's not my that's not my MO. Um, be very careful and look at the handle to make sure it's me. Again, it's at Dave H. Contrarian. Um, and so uh, be aware there are fake accounts there that uh, are not me. Um, and and I also write a um, investment letter that comes out quarterly. I just had my most recent one come out. Um, and if people have any interest in that, it is a subscription newsletter so there's there's a cost to it but they can always direct message me on twitter and i'll be glad to provide um information on that awesome yeah that that sounds great i'll throw the links you know to your twitter in the video description below and uh again thanks for hanging out i'm sure we'll catch up again in another quarter or so and see how everything's panning out yeah sounds great eric have a good weekend all right you too thank you